Um, well, as as Comrade John said, the 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 idea of uh, of this of this tour and going to different cities was going around and talking to both Americans and Canadians, but also Iranians in, in different places. Who, by the way, I welcome. We're very happy to see some Iranians in Minnesota as well. Um, and and talking about what the Iranian communist youth say. And it wasn't, it, it, and you know, Fred was talking about sort of post Marxist. In, in Iran, we have a lot of, you know, a lot of communists, especially, you know, from, from the past generations. But we'll get to what happened to a lot of communists in Iran. But there is still a lot around. I'm sure, you know, in the United States too. Maybe even in Minnesota, if you really look around. And, and, you know, there was this idea that communism was a thing of the past, was a, was a tendency really related to the past generation in Finnish. And we, well, the people in Mubarza and, and a lot of the Iranian youth and the students trying to say, no, we think the ideas of Marxism, the idea of communism are very relevant, very relevant to uh, what's happening in our uh, country. And then a new communist force can be can be built, which, which you know, with, with its a strong force to be within the youth uh, and workers who form a very important part of Europe. I should also begin by saying that I am very happy to uh, speak in a, in a beautiful uh, bookshop like this. I'm very happy to speak in the United States of America. Um, there are uh, there are a lot of misconceptions about the relation between between our people and the people of Iran and the people of the United States. There are some who think, I mean, a lot of mainstream of Americans that I speak to, there are some who think, oh, people in Iran all see U.S. as just a great Satan and, and you know, very negative force. Whereas the Iranian people, for very good reasons, have always had, uh, you know, warm relations with the people of the United States and understood the difference between the imperialist government and their, and their people. Before before the times of uh, at, at the time of uh, seventy nine revolution, for example, there was there was all this correspondence between between Iranian uh, revolutionaries and American revolutionaries and and you know, relations between them. Um, but I would say that there are misconceptions about the United States in Iran. But also one that was more relevant to what I want to talk about is the misconceptions about Iran and Iranian revolution in America. A lot of people that I've talked to uh, have asked in the, on the left, you know, you say, oh, you're an Iranian communist. Very well, you should be a big fan of Ahmadinejad, isn't it? <laughs> and, and this is actually not only the United States, you know, countries like Malaysia, Bangladesh, and different countries of many food from all of here the same. So today I would like to briefly talk about uh, what do Iranian communists do, what do they face, and what kind of a regime do we have? Uh, in the country, and what, what is our relation to that, and uh, the movements that have begun since 2001. The, the idea that for some reason the, the regime in Iran is some kind of a progressive thing, of course, comes from the 79 revolution. The idea that, well, it was based on a revolution, a great revolution, a great popular revolution, that has stood up against imperialism. Before that, we had a government in Iran that is true, was so linked to U.S. imperialism. If you, if you talk to my dad and a generation before, I, I, you know, I remember, I asked him, you know, what songs do you sing in a school and stuff? And one of the songs they say was that, you know, was about uh, John F. Kennedy. was like, Kennedy was a friend of, uh, is a friend of children. Kennedy is a friend of children. <laughs> <laughs> Kennedy. <laughs> Kennedy will bring, uh, you know, the words, Kennedy will bring love to Iran. And, you know, with, with them together, we can move. And, and, and that kind of thing, or, or about Israel, and Israel is our only friend of Iran in the neighborhood, um, <laughs> saving us, you know, uh, saving, uh, saving us from the uh, sort of dangers in the neighborhood, you know, together we walk together. So this was the kind of regime we had. So definitely the 79 revolution had a very, very progressive thing to it. By, by standing up to that and wanting to get rid of the regime and get rid of, of this humiliating relationship of, of Iran being an underdog of, of, of uh, you know, Western imperialism and especially U.S. imperialism. But that revolution was stolen, was hijacked by a group of people with a certain ideology which previous to those dates, if you look, was totally absent from the region. And that is what I call, you know, fundamentalist 
Islam or Islamism, if you know, fundamentalist uh, religion. In fact. If you look at the history of our country and actually the other countries of the region, you will see that this force was a non, non-present. 40s, 50s, 60s, look at the Iranian politics. What do you see? You see you know, Iranian nationalism, Arab nationalism, socialism, communism, different forces. No, nobody, like there are, there are various a small Islamic sects that we can talk about during, during the history. But they were never a, you know, nobody would believe of seeing a Islamist running a revolution as, as, as big as that. And by the way, there are some, you know, here I'm, I'm looking, there are some pictures of the demonstrations of the time of 79 revolution. For some reason, it's not only, you know, mullahs with long beards. Um, <laughs> which, which is, this is the idea, actually, when you read a lot of histories of, of the Iranian revolution, that's the idea that you get, that, you know, Shah was too modern and too, the Shah, sort of king of Iran, too westernized, and these people were saying, oh, enough of this, let's get some real Islam going on here, like, that's, <laughs> that's the kind of idea you get, right, it's not true, and, and there's, 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 there's not enough time, on Marxist.com there are some very good articles about that, enough to say that Islamism, if, if it has any place of creation as a movement, it's not Kabul, it's not Tehran, it's, you know, it's much closer to here. It's in Washington, in the administration of John Foster Dawes as the Secretary of the State, um, under Richard Nixon, I believe, and then later, uh, and, and then later elaborated by different governments. There was, there's obviously a, there's obviously a sort of material basis for it in the region, but they pumped it up, they paid, you know, thousands of dollars to, to different Islamist groups uh, in order to make them the uh, sort of the, <coughs> the prominent one. Let us remember that Mr. Khomeini didn't come with a donkey from Qom, which is a religious city in Iran. He came with flew with Air France, you know, probably first class as well from Paris. Uh, a year before the revolution, he was not a force again in Iranian politics as in as much as he later become. It was put into by by the BBC for some reason, BBC World Service. Uh, in Persian, he was put into a spotlight, given interviews and all that, and then he was flown into Iran. So what I'm trying to say is that in a, in a process, they hijacked the revolution, and on the basis of that, they started a massive counter-revolution, the destruction of all workers' organizations, the Communist Party of Iran to the party, and also the other uh, guerrilla organizations, Fedai guerrilla organizations, who majority of them, they, they quickly became a mass force. Fedayan had 500,000 due-paying members only. Um, and you know, those of you who have tried to get due-paying members, you know, it's not a very easy thing. <laughs> <laughs> so 500,000 only that, you know, really massive social force. And, and they all, again, well, not enough time, but I would say the, the main weakness was that they all accepted this, the silence idea of the US stage uh, theory of, of revolution, which said that at the moment you shouldn't fight for socialism, but you know different things, um, and the uh, Soviet Union, backing the Communist Party back then, uh, had an idea of, of Khomeini being able to lead what they called non-capitalist world of development, um, and the, the process basically continued by Khomeini and the Islamist mullahs consolidating their base by by attacking the left, by, by attacking people very smartly and at, at different periods. In a period from from 79 to 81, which we I would call the birthday of the Islamic Republic, is really 81, the summer of 1981, June actually, the anniversary is near, is when they started a mass war on, on, on communists and militants and killed thousands of them until summer 1988, a, a very dark summer for us who estimates of up to 20,000 communists and socialists were massacred by Khomeini. So you can, you can, you can uh, think how I feel when I see you know, Mr. Ahmadinejad coming to New York and some groups on the left you know, throwing a red carpet for him to come and speak. I mean, this, this uh, man and this regime are murderers of, of, of communists and socialists and, and trade unionists in Iran. And well, myself, John mentioned we are from a generation of communists who also felt this by the way. Our comrades in Iran were imprisoned and, and tortured under both, you know, Mr. Khatami, the reformist president, and obviously much more severely uh, under Mr. Ahmadinejad. But the but the seeds of that revolution, 
the idea that those that revolution was was hijacked and was stolen from us was never totally absent in our generation. That the Iranian people chose different ways to oppose this regime and fight against it. But you know they tried different routes, roads. If you if you by the way, Fred didn't sort of talking about the Arab world did mention our our articles about about that and about we pre, you know predicting what was happening. But this was also true about Iran by the way. Because if you look, and I remember I had so many conversations in Iran actually, and outside uh, later with people about this is, you know, a lot of Iranians even from our generation would say, look, I'm down for revolution, but these people will never move. You know, Iranians, we are now, all, all of us are, you know, whether drug addicts, a, a major problem in Iran, and you know, we will never move, you will never see a revolution in Iran. I like it, you know, I, and, you know, it's funny, we've been a party of, Iranian parties are usually, you know, big dicks. So we're like 50, 100 people, and everyone would say, we all agree, but those people are out there. I never understood, <laughs> <who they are. laughs> I never understood who are those people out there, because you never, you never could meet a person who say, I'm not out, down for this, but it was, oh, no, no, you know, there's religious people out there that would never support the thing, but you would, you know, you would never see, um, you never see anybody who doesn't agree with that. But in the aftermath of the elections in 2009, we saw the rise of the great revolutionary movements in Iran. Who has stood up the regime, and this movement, like any other, was a very naive one at the beginning. There were very, very different ideas present. I would say that socialism and, and communism weren't, you know, as as popular at the beginning, especially given the fact that a unfortunate day, this is a, a lot of problems with our vanguards in the history of the left in Iran. I mean, you know, you see the problem. The vanguard is supposed to be the one who is at the front and going, but usually the vanguards in the Iranian left history, after revolution happens, it, it, it takes a couple of months for them to contemplate of you know what is it that should be done and then come. So it's a bit hard to be vanguard when you're running after <laughs> things and saying, oh yeah, look, um, I've worked out my perspectives now. But um, <laughs> but um, yeah, but. <laughs> But I would say that through my own experience of, of Mubarizeh, which I'll briefly talk a little bit about also, ideas of Marxism are very, uh, how to say, welcomed by young people. That, you know, revolution, one of the beautiful things of revolution, and I see this with uh, Egypt and Tunisia as well, for sure, is that people start to question everything. People, people have such a thirst for ideas, such a thirst. Like in Iran, in this, and this was a revolution in making. We always say, you look at any section of Iran's history, look at teachers, look at workers, look at the Iran Hodro, which is a, a car factory near Tehran, uh, full of, uh, full of uh, struggles and strikes. Look at anywhere, you see these boilings in society and these questions. So on, uh, on our days of Iran, uh, I, was, I was telling my friend before, the independent bookstores in Iran, when there was an opportunity for a lot of books to come out, they were doing very well. <laughs> They were doing very well, and they were saying all kind of books. I remember when the Lenin collected books the first, you know, republished in Iran. There, I tried to get to the bookstore. I found out like it's published, and after third day, and I go, there was a line, and like there was a line to the, in the bookstore actually to get the book, and we hadn't even reached the mid, middle of the line. I said, okay, we finished again, and they had published like ten thousand. But as usual, books don't sell very well. There was a, there was a capitalist friend of mine who published a lot of um, sort of romantic books and stuff who, who were very popular. And then he said, "Look, man, I, I I can't, you know, these romantic books aren't selling as well." So the last thing is published, and he said, "Here is my hit right now." Grandery said, "A very complex work by Marx, <laughs> you know." And he said, "Oh, everybody buys this," and <laughs> and it's true. You would see it everywhere. So you we gotta we gotta read what Marx says. You know, this is, is relevant to uh, to the stuff that are happening. So excuse me, Ben, what? What this? Uh, um, I'm saying. saying. I'm saying this. So I came to. I I left Iran uh, in the year um, 2008. So I'm saying 2006, yeah. five, four. Sort of oh. the the peak year. You know, before Ahmadinejad comes and the Khatam and the books were much yeah. more open mm -hmm. for a for a period of few years. Um, but what I'm what I'm trying to talk about. You know, <laughs> The, what I'm trying to talk about is that this ferment in Iranian society had led to the popularity of, of the ideas of Marxism and socialism within you know, sort of uh, other ideas as well. You know, what I'm trying to say basically was that very, very thirsty population for ideas. And 
what I'm trying to show Iran is not, 